Mind you, I'd have to say, it took me a good many years to mine these truths out of the Word of God. I'm sharing with you in an hour or two things that have cost me hours and days and weeks and months and years. I say cost, but after all, it was a blessing and a privilege. All right, the next exchange is stated in Galatians chapter 3. Have you gone from curse to blessing? Galatians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Remember that the cross is called a tree because in some languages Hebrew is one and Swahili in East Africa is another. A tree is a tree whether it's growing or whether it's cut down. You understand? So the cross was a cut down tree. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now, how many theologians do we have here who can discern the two opposites? What is the evil? Curse. What is the good? Blessing. All right, so Jesus on the cross was made a curse. It says in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 21, verses 22 and 23, that anyone who is hung on a tree becomes a curse. So when Jesus was hung on the tree of the cross, every Jew who knew his Torah, his, his Old Testament, knew that Jesus had been made a curse. He was visibly made a curse. He was made a curse that we might receive the blessing. This is a, an area which God has led me into in the last four or five years. And because I'm not going to have time to go into it in detail, I want to just recommend to you the same book that I mentioned earlier, How to Pass from Curse to Blessing. Um, it's not fair just to leave you knowing that you've been redeemed from the curse that you might receive. The, this is the how-to of it. Let me just mention seven common indications of a curse. Now, most curses don't concern merely individuals. They concern families or larger communities. And the essential feature of both curse and blessing in the Bible is that they go on from generation to generation to generation unless something happened to cut them off. So we have dealt with people whose problems went back hundreds of years. I don't know whether there are any Scottish people here tonight. Don't put your hand up if, if there are. But I have learned that the Scots were a nation of curses. Not in the sense of swearing, but in cursing one another. And Ruth and I have dealt in the last few years with two families who had curses pronounced on them in the 1600s that were still at work in those families. One was in Scotland, the other was in Australia. Anyhow, just very briefly, let me give you, on the basis of my personal observation, seven common indications that there may be a curse over your life. Now, if there's only one of these, I'm not saying for sure there is a curse, but if there are several of them, and if they are found in your family in different areas and in different generations, you can be almost sure that there is a curse. Here they are. First of all, mental and emotional breakdown. Second, repeated or chronic sicknesses, especially if they're hereditary. Because the hereditary is the indication of the curse. Third, repeated miscarriages or related female problems. And in our ministry to the sick, Ruth and I have come to the place, when we encounter that, we simply deal with it as a curse. Four, breakdown of marriage and family alienation. If 
there's a history in your family of falling apart and splitting up and it goes on and on and repeated and repeated you can be sure there's a curse over that family five financial insufficiency if it continues all of us can know insufficiency at certain times but if it's persistent and we never got out from under it you can be almost sure it's a curse six what they call accident prone are naturally prone to accidents and this is an objective statistical fact which insurance companies take into account when they assess, assess your insurance premium and seven in a family a history of suicides or unnatural deaths now we're not going to dwell on that tonight but we're going to affirm the solution thank God we never as Christians have to focus exclusively on the problem we deal with the problem in order to point to the solution so we're going to deal with this one now Jesus was made a curse that we might receive the that's it. you're all theologians tonight all right are you ready it's not just a formality you're saying this every time you say it God and the holy angels and the Holy Spirit are all taking note of what you're saying remember Jesus is the high priest of what your confession that's right you are making a confession all right um, we'll say it together Jesus was made a curse that we might receive the blessing amen all right the next one is really part of that but it's such an important part that I deal with it separately Jesus on the cross endured our poverty that we might share his wealth now this came to me as a revelation years ago here in New Zealand I was invited over with my first wife one year to speak and uh, when we got here they had promised to pay our fares to and from the United States they didn't have the money but that was all right they said we're going to take up an offering and we want you to preach on offering <laughs> so I was motivated uh, if I remember rightly it was in Auckland well I, I've taught on money many times and I've got that book there that's part of my teaching you know God's plan for your money but um, so I had my outline and I was preaching on it but a strange thing happened as I was going through my outline mentally I was seeing Jesus on the cross and I saw him as he really was stripped totally naked and as I defined the aspects of poverty I saw that every one of them exactly applied to Jesus on the cross well they took the offering at the end and they had four cartons used for apples at the front of this on the platform and the people streamed forward to put their money in or to put in their pledges and that one offering covered the total expenses of everything next day Lydia and I were in Auckland with the pastor and we met the people going to their savings accounts to draw out the money <laughs> that they'd promised the previous night I have never seen a more abundant offering and the people were what the Bible calls hilarious givers they were almost intoxicated with the excitement of giving but now I'll share with you the revelation that I got now first of all let's do the scriptures the New Testament scriptures 2nd Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9 2nd Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9 for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich yet for your sakes he became poor that you through his poverty might be rich now you don't have to be a theologian to see the opposites do you what's the bad thing poverty what's the good thing riches all right now on the opposite side of the exchange 
is in 2 Corinthians 9, 8, which Ruth and I have already recited once. Come on, sweetheart, we'll do it again. I feel better every time we do it. You've got to get near to the microphone. Okay? Now, wait a minute, I'm going to think what it says. All right. God is able to make all grace abound toward us, that we always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. See if you can find any area that's not covered by that promise. God is able to make all grace abound toward us. Not some grace, but all grace that we always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. That's the level of God's provision for his people made possible by the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. He was made poor that we might share, I, I prefer to say abundance, because I don't think it's necessarily scriptural that every Christian will have a large bank account, or drive a Rolls Royce. But I do believe it's God's will for every Christian to have his needs supplied and enough left over to give to others. Because it's more blessed to give than to receive and God doesn't want any of his children to live on the lower level of blessing. So he provides abundance that we may be able to have the higher level of giving to others. Now some people picture Jesus in his earthly ministry as a kind of poor preacher wandering around in rags looking for handouts. I don't think that was true. I don't think he was poor. He, he was clothed like a normal man of his day and he had a very elegant seamless robe on top of, el of the others which was so valuable that the soldiers at the cross wouldn't divide it, they cast lots for it. I just say this, Jesus didn't carry a lot of cash he just used his father's credit card. <laughs> and it was always honored. I mean, any man who can feed 5,000 men plus women and children in a wilderness and leave them abundantly satisfied is not poor. And there was a time when the question arose about the tax money. He didn't send Peter to the bank. He sent him to the Sea of Galilee. But I mean, the money came. What difference does it make? Jesus said at the Last Supper to his disciples, when I sent you out without staff or purse or other provision, did you lack anything? And what did they answer? Nothing. There's a lot of missionaries who got abundant allowances and equipped with cars and houses who lack a lot of things. But those first apostles lacked nothing because they were supplied out of God's abundance. All right. Let's look now for a moment at the chapter of curses. Which is that? How many of you know which is the chapter of curses? Deuteronomy chapter 28, that's right. It's blessings and curses. It's got 68 verses. It's a long chapter. The first 14 verses are blessings and the remaining 54 verses are curses. And if you're ever in doubt as to what a curse is, just read those 54 verses. You may find that as a Christian you've been enduring curses when you should have been enjoying blessings. Now in the middle of this, two verses in the list of curses, 47 and 48. And please note, this is a curse. Deuteronomy 28, verses 47 and 48. Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. That's God's will. But the alternative for the unbelieving and the disobedient, therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger, in thirst, in nakedness, and in need of all things. Take those four statements, hunger, thirst, nakedness, need of all things. What is that? In one word, poverty, that's right. Absolute poverty. You can have no greater poverty than that, being hungry, thirsty, naked, and need of all things. Now picture Jesus for a moment on the cross. 
He was hungry. He hadn't eaten for 24 hours. He was thirsty. One of his last statements was, I thirst. He was naked, they'd stripped him of all his clothes. And he was in need of everything. He didn't have a single thing. When the time came for him to be buried, he was buried in a borrowed robe and a borrowed tomb. Why? Because he exhausted the poverty curse. That we might have what? The abundance. See the exchange? All right, let's say it. I'll say it once and then you say it with me. Jesus endured our poverty that we might share his abundance. Okay? Jesus endured our poverty that we might share his abundance. Look happy, it's good news. I tell Christians, it's no sin for a Christian to be happy. <coughs> we'll do, quickly do two more aspects. Our time is beginning to run out, and I want to just wrap it up in a minute. But Jesus, and I'm going to say this, endured our shame that we might share his glory. If you turn to Matthew 27, you'll find the description of the crucifixion. Matthew 27, verses 35 and 36. Then they crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots. They took from him all his clothes. A man in those days had four items of clothing. There were four soldiers. One soldier took one into me. Then they cast lots for the seamless robe. Then it says in verse 36, sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Now, I want to say this in a way that is discreet, but Jesus was exposed naked to the eyes of all who passed by. And it's a very interesting thing that you'll notice in the record of the gospel, the women that came with him stood at a distance. The only woman who came close was his mother. The Bible is so discreet. He endured our shame. Now, what's the opposite? We'll turn to Hebrews again, chapter 2 and verse 10, the very next verse after the one we looked at. For it was fitting for him, that's God the Father, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to make the author of their salvation, that's Jesus, perfect through sufferings. What was God's purpose? To bring many sons to what? To glory. How was that made possible? Because Jesus endured our shame that we might share his glory. I've discovered in counseling people that one of the deepest wounds of the human heart is shame. And there are many different causes, but one very common cause in our contemporary culture is in children who've been sexually abused in childhood. And in America, they estimate that's true of one in every four children in the United States today. And it leaves a scar, a shame. But thank God we don't have to stop with the problem. We've got the solution. And I have helped many people. Jesus endured your shame that you might share his glory. You, fee you, you find some people, I'm, I'm not <laughs> looking at anybody, so I want to be very careful. But you'll see some people who, when they pray, never lift their face up to God. They always keep their head down like that. Usually, the problem is shame. When a person is delivered, Job said, I will lift up my face without spot to God. Many times we're not aware of the secret bondage that holds us. 
but the release from every bondage is provided through the cross. So let's do the exchange. I think you can do it this time without my coaching you. You're a wonderful group of people. All right. Jesus endured our shame that we might share his glory. All right. Now just one more and we're going to close. That's not the end of the list, but it's the end for tonight. The final exchange is between rejection and acceptance. And here again in ministering to people, I have come to the conclusion that rejection is the deepest wound that the human heart can bear. A mark of rejection is that such a person always feels on the outside, looking in. Others can get in, I can't. Another mark of rejection is the inability to express love. John says we love God because he first loved us. I believe we can't express love if love has never been expressed to us. It takes the expression of love to release the expression of love. And the commonest single reason why so many in our contemporary civilization carry the wound of rejection is the attitude and conduct of parents. First of all, if a woman is pregnant, and resents the little new life that she's carrying in her womb and says things like, I wish I done one, wasn't going to have another baby. That little life feels that rejection in the womb and the baby is frequently born with a spirit of rejection. I've dealt with this in many cases. Then again, when a baby is born, the first longing of every child planted in it by God is for warm, expressed, outgoing love from parents and primarily from fathers. I have come to the conclusion it's a father's love, warm and expressed, that gives a child security. Oh, the strength of being held in daddy's arms and clasped against his chest. But you see, in our contemporary culture, I think in the United States, 50% of children today never receive that. And they go through life with this inner wound of rejection. Oh, how I thank God that there's a solution. Let me relate this little story. I won't make it long, but I was in a camp meeting some years back in the United States and I was due to preach and I was walking across the campground and I was in danger of being late for my assignment. So I was walking very quickly and there was a lady walking just as quickly in the opposite direction and we ran into one another. So after we kind of pulled ourselves together, she said, Mr. Prince, I was praying that if God wanted me to speak to you, we'd meet. <laughs> well, I said, we have met. But I can only give you two minutes because I have to be in the auditorium to preach. So tell me what your problem is. And she spoke for about one minute and she would have gone on for 20. I said, listen, I have no more time. I think I understand your problem. I want you to say this prayer after me. And I d didn't have in mind exactly what I was going to pray. I didn't tell her what I was going to pray, but I prayed something like this. God, I thank you that you are my father, that I am your child. You really love me. I'm not rejected. I'm not unwanted. I'm a member of the family of God, the best family in the universe. Thank you, God. You are my father. I am your child. You love me and I love you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, God. And I said, there you are, goodbye. About a month later, I got a letter from that lady. She described the situation, how we'd met, so that she'd be sure that I knew who she was. And she said, I just want to tell you, Mr. Prince, praying that simple prayer after you has completely changed my life. What happened to her? She passed from rejection 
to acceptance. You realize what it was to be a child of God. Listen, if your parents failed you, there's a lot of things we can't change in the past. But your relationship to God, we can guarantee. Look at this picture of Jesus. So this is the last one we look at. Matthew 27, verses 45 through 51. Now from the sixth hour, which was twelve noon, until the ninth hour, that's three p.m., there was darkness over all the land. Matthew 27, verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there when they heard that said, This man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. The rest said, let him alone, let us see if Elijah will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried out again with a loud voice, yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. You see, Jesus did not die of the physical effects of crucifixion. When Pilate heard he was already dead, he was surprised because normally he would have lived maybe two hours longer. What did he die of? He died of a broken heart. What broke his heart? Rejection. By whom? By the Father. That's right. For the first time in the history of the universe, the Son of God cried out to the Father and the Father did not answer. Stopped his ears, averted his eyes. Why? Because Jesus has been made sin with our sinfulness and God cannot look upon sin with favor. Jesus endured our rejection. And immediately after that, he gave up his spirit and the first thing that happened was the temple veil was torn in two from top to bottom. It was extremely thick. Human beings couldn't have torn it in two even from the bottom, but it was from top to bottom because it was the affirmation that God had done it. That was the veil that separated unholy men from a holy God. And when Jesus endured our rejection, God gave us his acceptance as his children. Let's look to Ephesians chapter 1 for a moment. Ephesians, the first chapter. We'll read verses 3 through 6. Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. What's the exchange? See if you can say it without my coaching. Jesus endured our rejection that we might have his acceptance. Wonderful, we'll do it again. Jesus endured our rejection that we might have his acceptance. Let me very quickly go through the eight aspects of the exchange that we've looked at and I'll do them with my hands. I'll tell you what, I'll do them once and then you do them after me the second time. Now we're not going to delay, time is slipping away, all right? Jesus was punished that we might be forgiven. Listen, this time I want you to make it personal. Don't say we, say I. Jesus was punished that I might be forgiven. Can you heave a sigh of relief? Jesus was wounded that I might be healed. 
Jesus was made sin with my sinfulness, that I might be made righteous with his righteousness. Jesus died my death, that I might share his life. Jesus was made a curse for me, that I might receive the blessing. Jesus endured my poverty, that I might share his abundance. Jesus endured my shame, that I might share his glory. Jesus endured my rejection, that I might have his acceptance. Now if we really believe that, you know what we have to do? We have to thank God. There's just nothing else we can do. Let's take a little while to thank him, shall we? All of us, freely thank him. That's the best expression of faith, is to thank him. Thank him. Thank him. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise your wonderful name. Praise your wonderful name. We believe you, Lord. We believe you. We thank you. We bless you. Blessed be your holy name, Lord Jesus. You did it all for us. And we want to say thank you tonight. Now, if there are those of you here tonight who've never personally thanked Jesus, for what he did for you, that he died in your place, that he was made sin with your sinfulness, that you may be made righteous with his righteousness, that he endured your rejection, that you might have his acceptance. We would like to give you, just in a few closing moments, the opportunity to make that decision here tonight and affirm it. We're talking now of people who've never actually accepted the atonement of Jesus on their behalf for their sins, for their souls, to receive eternal life. You've had that presented and painted before you tonight from the Word of God. The Spirit of God is tugging at your heart and you say, I want to make it mine tonight. I want to be sure that I have it. I don't want to go out of this place uncertain or confused. It's very simple. What I'm going to ask you to do, if you want to settle this with God tonight, is just one simple thing. Stand up right where you are right now, and I'll lead you in a very simple prayer that will make it yours. Don't hesitate, and don't wait, because we're not going to prolong this service much longer. You feel your need to make a personal affirmation of your acceptance of the sacrifice of Jesus on your behalf. Jesus said, if you will confess him before men, he will confess you before the Father. If you deny him before men, he will deny you before the Father. So if you want to make that confession, here tonight, don't look around. If God is dealing with you, you stand to your feet right where you are. Don't be embarrassed. Stand up and say, God, I want that tonight, wherever you are. We'll pray for you.